Dr. Cabrini Pac is here to talk about the life and legacy of Father Bruno Lanteri, who is known as the founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today. Thank you for having me. So tell us first of all about his cause for sainthood. I know you're very involved. Why mm -hmm. did you become involved? And, and tell us a little bit about him. Um, okay, so in terms of my involvement, I'm actually a really good friend of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, and that is the congregation that Venerable Bruno founded. Um, his cause for canonization has actually been underway for a long time. So he was declared venerable in 1965, and so <laughs> it's been a few years. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, with Venerable Bruno, he was already, there's several steps in canonization, so he was already um, put forth by the bishop, and a positio was submitted, and they declared him to have heroic virtue, which in, in that case he's declared venerable, and that was 1965. And I was actually brought on board to kind of help increase the awareness of Father Lanteri throughout the United States and beyond. Um, so I'm serving as a consultant for them. And um, with Father Lanteri, his main ministry was the spiritual exercises and forming the laity and priests. And then he had another apostolate, which we can talk about later, um, called the Amicizia Christiana, which was the Christian friendship. Tell us a little bit about his life, though. So he was a priest of the North Piedmont region of Italy um, in the 1700s, 1800s. And he lived most of his adult life under the occupation of Napoleon. So very anti-Catholic regime, um, very much suppressive of the church. And Napoleon had originally captured Pope Pius VI. Um, Pius VI died while in captivity. Pius VII took over. Um, and he was captive for another 14 years. And so a lot of his life was spent under the occupation of a very hostile regime. Um, and Lanteri is probably best known for his work with the Amicizia Christiana, which was the Christian Friendship. And that was started by his spiritual director, um, a Jesuit by the name of Nicholas von Diesbach. Um, and together they had spread good Catholic reading in a public square where anti-Catholicism was very much in the air. Um, and defending the church from errors, there was a heresy called Jansenism that really kind of led to an almost hopelessness in the faithful. So. I remember um, Father Tim Gallagher, he's the local expert on Venerable Bruno, was saying, you know, you'd have a scene where 400 people would go in for communion or confession, and 400 people would be denied because the priests were not absolving them. They were not giving them communion because they didn't think they were in a state of grace. And so there's this kind of like the spiritual hopelessness in, in that milieu. And so Venerable Bruno and Father Diesbach and the Amicizia worked to combat Jansenism, which was that heresy, but also to spread good Catholic reading in a way that dispelled some of the errors that were floating around with regards to the church. And the Oblates of the Virgin Mary are here in Boston? They are, yes. Um, so they run St. Um, Francis Chapel, which is in the Prudential Mall, so a little chapel in the mall, and um, St. Clement Shrine, which is a uh, Eucharistic Adoration Shrine on Boylston Street. Um, and they also run a retreat house in Milton, Massachusetts, called St. Joseph's Retreat House. Okay, so he's venerable. If you could mm -hmm. explain a little bit what that means and what the next step would be okay. um, if he were ever to become a saint. So um, if you're venerable, that means that what has happened prior to being declared venerable is a positio and a period of inquiry has occurred where they look at the person's writings, their life, witness statements, just all kinds of things, and um, try to determine, you know, what was the sanctity of this person. And if they find that there was no obstacle for this person to move forward, and they're declared of having heroic virtue, then they're declared venerable. And that happened in 1965. Um, the next step really is we're just waiting for the miracles. So <laughs> on the website, we have um, an opportunity for people to enter prayer requests. And we've actually had hundreds of prayer requests coming in. So on the back end of that, we have a database where we just keep track of that. And some people have reported healings. And you know we have to submit all of the documentation to the procurator um, who is in Italy. Mm -hmm. And then once a healing is determined to be a miracle, that would be the first step towards beatification. And then, and then another a second miracle, miracle for canonization would be necessary. So for people who don't understand this whole process, and I think even a lot of Catholics sure. don't understand the whole process, why is this significant and important? And you say, well, okay, this guy, you know, he, he's credited for a miracle, but what mm -hmm. about, you know, the person down the street? Can you explain mm -hmm. the difference? And when you're praying to the saints, mm -hmm. you're really praying for intercessory prayer. You're not mm -hmm. bowing down and worshiping no. them. You're asking them to pray for you, right. um, you know, to yeah. Jesus, of course. Um, so they both kind of fall under the category of intercessory prayer. So I'll just explain um, really quickly by a scriptural. There's a lot of scriptural precedent for this. So in the Gospel of um, Luke, there was a paralytic. There was a time when Jesus was in the house and there were so many people around there, the door was blocked and these guys are bringing their friend who's paralyzed and they find out they can't get him through the door. What do they do? They crawl up to the roof, they tear the roof open and they lower him down. <laughs> 
right, <laughs> put him in front of Jesus because they knew that Jesus would heal them, right? The intercessors in that account are the guys that were on the roof that were bringing their friends. So oh. they're asking to intercede. That verb means to ask on behalf of, right? So the intercessors in that case are the guys on the roof lowering the paralytic down. Jesus is still doing the miracle. They're still bringing him to Jesus, but they're the ones carrying that person over. Um, a second example, it's one of my favorites, is in the Gospel of John. I think it's chapter 2, and it's the wedding feast of Cana. You know, Mary's there, and it says, and Jesus and his friends were also invited, right? Well, the wine runs dry, and Mary notices this, and so she goes over to her son, and she says, they have no wine. <laughs> you do know, something. he answers <laughs> with something cryptic, you know, woman, what does this have to do with me? My time is not yet come, right? She doesn't even respond to that. She just says to the servers, do whatever he says, because she's his mom. She knows right. he's going to do something, right? She's the intercessor. Wow. She's asking on behalf of the couple, because she knows, hey, it's a wedding, you need wine. Um, and he's the one that does the miracle. So in both cases, um, Jesus is the one doing the miracle, but the people that are interceding are the ones bringing those people's needs to Jesus. Just like we pray, like exactly. I would pray for you, you would pray for me, right? We're interceding, exactly. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, and yeah. I really love how you explain that with the Bible, because a lot yeah. of times Catholics are accused <laughs> of not knowing the Bible, yeah. but it's right yeah. in there. It, it's in there. There's a lot of scriptural precedent for so that. So that's really, really mm -hmm. exciting. So what do people have to do to become more aware of this, and obviously, mm -hmm. you know, to pray yeah. on behalf of this uh, cause and effort? So we have a, we have a website, um, and it's www.omvusa.org. And Bruno Lanteri's name is in the corner there, so they can just click on that, and we have a whole website there dedicated to him, and we have an active guild now. So the guild um, helps to promote his um, story and to bring in prayer requests and you know, distribute prayer cards. Um, so we have, you know, we have pamphlets that have his writings on there as well as um, prayer cards there that people can, um, can use for, for their own uh, petitions, and we have them actually translated now into four different languages. So, okay. so yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Cabrini Pac, for coming in. I, I need to have you come teach my CCD class because that was excellent. <laughs> I will have to rewind the show for them. Uh